Good evening and welcome to Three Core Live. The Three Core Live is an outreach ministry of the Nation of Christ Church in Port Clinton, Ohio, led by my friend and brother Tony Calloway. Listen, we have an awesome lineup of teachers and preachers during the week. On Monday, we have ministers Michelle Brown and Minister Tammy Wilson. They are doing Girl Power, Batman and Robin, uh, Starsky and Hutch. I don't know what you want to call them, but they are really doing an, a tremendous job of showing the love and grace of God. And on Tuesday, we have Elder Mother Paula Curley, who is the head of the Freedom Fighter Cell Group of the Nation of Christ Church. And Mother breaks down the gospel and bridges the gap between old school church and new covenant grace. And you don't want to miss that. On Wednesdays, we have my friend and brother, Bishop Tony Calloway, teaching from his book, The Mind Game, M-I-N-D, which means moving in new directions. And I like to substitute dimensions with directions because it's bigger than that. But you really don't want to miss that. You can get that book on lulu.com. I highly, highly recommend it. On Thursdays, we have my friend and brother, Pastor Kyle Butler of New Beginnings Church in Patterson, New Jersey. And you talk about somebody who has a singular revelation of showing us the Father and, and what Jesus gave to, to put inside of us, man, this is like really, really powerful stuff. You really don't want to miss it. And on Mondays, uh, Pastor Kyle and Pastor Lynn Bennett Jr. are doing the Grace Line Mondays at 8 p.m. And you talk about just blowing the roof off all of the uh, lies that religion has told us and all of that. Man, the Grace Line is a good, good resource for you for that. And so today... Today is Freedom, or sorry, Freeology Friday. <laughs> Freeology Friday. And Freeology means either free theology or freedom from theology, depending on where you see yourself on the theological or faith spectrum. But I love Freeology because the whole thing is, is that if somebody sits down and share or stands up and shares the gospel with you and at the end of it you don't feel freer than when you first started then that means that one of you or both of you has possibly wasted your time because the whole objective of the gospel is to demonstrate the freedom that God gave us from the beginning this is it, because what, what Jesus came to show us was no more chains, no more shackles, no more yokes, no more bondage, okay? Really, really key that you get that. So today, I'm not going to talk long. I've, I've, got a, I've got some things that I need to do this evening, uh, but what I want to share with you is <laughs> the song that I was playing was the theme song from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was a really key component of my childhood, but it is even more significant to me as an adult because it helps me to remember who is my neighbor. I think that in terms of the church, that we've completely missed that. And the, the proof of that is is how the church responds to the oppressed, to the disenfranchised, to the downtrodden. Listen, we have an obligation as being in Christ, right? those of us who are awakened to righteousness, those of us who understand the finished work, those who understand the end of covenants, we have a responsibility to minister to, that is to serve those who are less fortunate than us. And, and the key is that Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. He said in John 13, 34, 35, this is, if you don't have love, if love is not expressed, manifest, demonstrated in your life, then, then, whether are you are you awakened to Christ or not is really suspect. This is really, I mean, gosh, I can't explain. This is just really foundational, okay? 
it, it's like we start from this and build up. It, but if we don't get this, there's nothing to build on. If there's no, if there's no understanding of love, we have nothing. I, I mean, I, literally, we have nothing. If there's no understanding of love, man, we just need to quit preaching. Just, I mean, just stop. Because the, if, if there is no understanding, teaching, manifestation, demonstration of love, then, then forget, I mean, there's nothing. If, if there's no love, there's no gospel. I mean, period, full stop. So that being said, there are all kinds of things that are going on in the world today, and I'm not trying to get political or anything like that, but I'm going to say some things that, I mean, listen, we just need to, we just need to take a step back because honestly, brother, sister, if you cannot see these things, we we really need to go back and and really reexamine what do we believe in what what do we have faith in where what what are we what are we working toward what are we living i mean how are we living our lives we have to go back and reevaluate the whole freaking shooting match okay so there are there was an incident that happened uh, this week where a young man and his daughter drowned in a river and the pictures were all over the internet and the, and the pictures were horrible uh, because this man and his child, they drowned trying to get to America. Now, let me say this. I, I'm going to put this out here because the, the common argument is, well, you just don't let anybody into your house. That's right. You don't just let anybody into your house. That's your home. That's that's your 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 dwelling place, your sanctuary. And everybody is entitled to that. That that is a I think a basic human right. However, you don't have the right to decide on who moves into your neighborhood. See, this this goes back to some fundamental things about about things that this country has gone through. Because there were places where you couldn't live if you were the wrong skin color or the wrong religion. And it was like that for a long time. And, and, and we have proven, demonstrated empirically that, that that was not the right way to do things. Now, all of that being said, I'm going back to what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 10 in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, you have to understand this because the Samaritans were the people that would likely drink from the colored water fountains in Jesus' day. The Jews didn't have association with them. They considered them to be the dregs of society. They considered them to be the worst of the worst. They were, they were considered to be criminal. They were considered to be unruly. They were considered to be unholy, sacrilegious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, these were the worst of the worst. Now, mind you, before all of this happened, that... The only thing that divided the Jews from the Samaritans were space. There were no walls. There were no fences. It, the, it was just understood that if you were a Jew, you didn't fellowship with Samaritans. And if you were a Samaritan, you didn't fellowship with Jews. Now, here Jesus is dealing with some religious folks. Now, I'm, again, this is religious folks because the biggest pushback that you get right now concerning the border, concerning police brutality, concerning poverty, concern, you insert your social issue here. The pushback is from the religious folks. It's not from the world. The world is not... Listen, the world embraces, <laughs> whereas the, 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 the church repels. That's not how it's supposed to be, y'all. The, the church should be the institution that embraces and shares. But that's not the case. But here Jesus is dealing with 
some people and he and he, he says uh, he's talking about love and and he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself and <laughs> one of the religious leaders asks well who's my neighbor and Jesus took this as an opportunity to make a point because see here people will talk about oh you're talking about social justice again you're one of those social justice warriors Jesus dealt with social justice and he dealt with it in a very frank but loving manner. And here he takes a priest, uh, which is the, the religious leadership, right? And, and this priest sees a man in distress <coughs> and he walks past him. Then Jesus uses a Levite which is the church folk. And, and this person crossed the street to avoid a man in distress. Now this man had been, it, it, he had been beaten and he had been abused and it doesn't say by whom, but this is the case. The man is laying out on the street. He is human waste. But here Jesus takes the, the religious leadership and the religious followers and shows how they ignore the plight of the downtrodden and the disenfranchised, okay? Then he takes a Samaritan and, and he juxtaposes the priest and the Levite with the Samaritan to compare and contrast their behaviors toward this man who had been oppressed. Now, watch this. The Samaritan, and again, back in Jesus' day, the Samaritans were the folks who drank from the colored water fountains. You got to catch this. They were not looked upon positively at all. But Jesus takes the Samaritan and makes him the hero of the story because not only does he tend to the man in the street but he gets him up and out of his oppressed state ministers to his need and then sets him in a place where he can mend and be healed this is the dregs of society according to religious folks according to the church, according to the established hierarchy, helping someone in distress. And Jesus showed this because he wanted you to understand who is your neighbor. And when he finishes telling the story, he tells the religious leader who he's dealing with, he says, now you go and do likewise. I find it absolutely hilarious that in this day and age where we have electronic searches, Google and Yahoo, <clears throat> and we can do what we have big data, we can crunch data, we have translation engines and all of these different things, that with all of this, that this simple thing, this simple truth about what the gospel is and how to share the gospel, that this is completely overlooked. As a matter of fact, it is overlooked and walked over by religion, just like the priest and the Levites walked over and overlooked the man in the street. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is everyone. There is no one who is not your neighbor because there is no one who is not created in the image and the likeness of God. There is no one who is not in Christ. There is no one who you have the right to turn your nose up to or point your finger down to. You don't have that right. I don't have that right. This is being neighborly. And, 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 and again, I've said this over and over again, and I'm going to keep saying this, that love breaks down into two primary or chief components. That is empathy and love. 
if I look at you and your plight and what you're going through, and I don't, am, I am unwilling to see it through your eyes or unwilling to walk a mile in your footsteps, I do not have empathy. And if I don't have empathy, I cannot honestly say that I have love. If I'm saying that I'm loving, but I lack empathy, I am lying. S likewise, if I say that I love, I must say that I care. I care. I'm concerned about what it is that you're going through. I'm concerned about how you're doing. I'm concerned about how you feel. I'm concerned about you because you are part of the human fabric and therefore part of me. As you go, there go I. So I must have compassion toward you. But if I don't care, then I, if I say that I have love, but I don't care, I'm lying. And we have to stop this because, listen, if, we, if, if you want to call yourself a biblican or a covenant person or whatever it is, fine. But if, when you say you call yourself a Christian, which means a Christian, which means like Christ, which actually that's, that's a whole another teaching for another time because uh, I, I'm, I'm a son of God. I'm not a Christian. I, you know, I, I, I trust and believe in what Jesus Christ did, but the, the, the early Christians didn't call themselves Christians. They were called Christians by someone else. Anyway. If I say that I am of Christ, then I must say that I am of love. And if I say that I am of love, then I must have empathy and I must have compassion. Let me give you a little thought experiment that you could try at home. If someone says to you, hey, Joe, hey, Susie, how you doing? Respond to them thusly, do you care? Just ask them that. And I promise you that the results that you get, the responses that you get, they're going to be diverse and various. There are going to be some people who will stop and really reconsider their words. When, you ha when that happens, you have been successful in this thought experiment. But there are going to be some people that, are, that will actually respond to you with indignation. In other words, how dare you question them? And in that case, your thought experiment is successful also. This is the beautiful thing about this particular thought experiment is that it cannot fail. It, it's going to yield a result. The reason I say all of this is that when you shouldn't just be arbitrary or cavalier toward people. Every human being is created in the image and the likeness of God. Every human being has the, has the Christ dwelling in them. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling in them. Therefore, we cannot ignore anyone. And as my friend Tony Calloway so eloquently put it, that you don't have the right to segregate your love. Love is for everyone. That's an acronym for life, and Tony has used that also. <laughs> love is for everyone. So if that is the case, then that means we need to do a better job of loving. And, and, the, and the whole straw man, red herring argument of, well, would you let anybody into your house? Man, I let people into my house all the time. As a, as a pastor, I've opened my home to many. It's like if we we have a church function and we have something after church at our home, we don't tell the people that are are visiting in the church that they can't come and participate. They're welcome. I don't know them. They could be anybody. They could be criminals. They they drug dealers. Anything. But I I'm not concerned about that because my job is to demonstrate the love of Christ and and to show hospitality. That's the deal, y'all. We have to stop with all of it. And, and, and there are so many things. Listen, people talk about abortion. And, and listen, I'm going to be on the record, be very candid and very clear that I do not support abortion. I, 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 I think it's wrong. 
However, there are a couple of things. Number one, I'm not a woman. So until I get to the point where I can have some kids, <laughs> you know, where I can actually uh, carry a child in my womb, if you will, I have, no, I, I have nothing. I, I, I don't have anything to say to a woman because this is something that I, I don't have to deal with. Okay, so I'm not going to tell them what they should or should not do. I can only tell you what I think and that's it, right? The second thing is, is that there are bigger issues is that if you say that you are pro-life, in other words, pro your neighbor, then that means not only should you be pro-life or pro-birth, but you should also be uh, uh, anti-capital punishment, anti-war, uh, anti-poverty, all of these things, because all of these things are, are, they are part of life. Nobody deserves to die. You know, you should be against uh, police brutality where, where people are being uh, summarily executed by police. You should be against that because that is life. Somebody is being deprived of life. I understand. Listen, I support our police officers. And if a police officer's life is actually threatened and they have to respond with deadly force, then hey, que sera, sera. But if that there is no danger of uh, or threat to the police officer being posed, then, then the summary execution of a human being to, to satisfy uh, some other legal requirement is absolute nonsense. So here's the thing. Life is life. I don't care who it is. And, and, you know, people say, well, you know, human beings are born in the sand. Well, that means that there is no such thing as innocent life if you subscribe to that. But I subscribe to the notion that all human beings are loved by God and that all human beings are, are good because when God created us, he said about humanity that it was very good. So, if, if humanity is very good, then that means that all life is valuable. All life is precious. All life should be preserved. And all life should be protected. And I think that whatever safeguards need to be put into place in order to preserve the sanctity of life, they should happen. Now, that's my opinion. And there you have it. But what I want to say to you is this, in closing, is that your neighbor is the guy or the gal sitting next to you, across the street from you, behind you, above you, beneath you, around you, that wherever you are, there is humanity because as long as there is humanity, everyone is there. And because God is ubiquitous, God is in everybody and God is around everybody. And because God is love, then that means love should be the prevailing attitude of those who claim to be awakened or conscious to him. That's what I have for you today. I pray that it blesses you. I know that this is challenging and some of you are not gonna like it. Your torches and pitchforks are welcome. I'm a big boy, I don't care. But that being said, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me at www.derekday.com. Or you can hit me up on Instagram or Twitter. My handle is Derek E. Day. That's D-E-R-R-I-C-K-E-D-A-Y. Or you can check out my videos on YouTube. The channel is called Derek Day. Or you can check out the Love Forward podcast, which you will find on Apple iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podbean, and Blueberry. So I will close by saying, as I always do, that God loves you, and so do I. And listen, brother, sister, because you are part of humanity and created in the image and the likeness of God, that you are loved and you are valued. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.